Today, one of our biggest efforts is to fight Christian nationalism, which has become this very clear and present threat to religious freedom for all that's not just a Baptist distinctive, but an American distinctive. From Interfaith Alliance, this is the State of Belief. I'm Interfaith Alliance President Reverend Paul Brandeis Rauschenbusch in New York City. This week, Speaker of the House Mike Johnson keynoted a gala gathering of the National Association of Christian Lawmakers and received their NACL American Patriot Award for Christian Honor and Courage. The NACL is a well-funded initiative to inject a Christian nationalist agenda into state legislation nationwide. It's another example of the worst fears of those who treasure a pluralistic, inclusive vision for our democracy coming true since Johnson's elevation to be the third in line for the Oval Office. We'll get into this and other threats to the promise of religious freedom and civil rights for all, as well as effective strategies for pushing back with the Baptist Joint Committee's Holly Holman. And Interfaith Alliance Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy, Darcy Hirsch, will be here to highlight the steps that are needed to push back against this growing threat. We're growing the state of belief, building on our 17-year history by partnering with Religion News Service. And as part of the RNS family of podcasts, there's a next generation, the State of Belief podcast I want to make sure you're subscribed to. So please visit stateofbelief.com slash new podcast. It would really help to have you subscribe and to tell people you're close to about the conversations you are hearing. The State of Belief is made possible in great part by the generous support of our listeners. If you've made a donation, thank you for helping get these conversations heard by more people who need them. If you haven't pitched in yet, information on how you can help get this show heard by more people is available at stateofbelief.com. And you can find out more about the work of Interfaith Alliance and join us at interfaithalliance.org. And now to my first guest. A growing number of Americans are waking up to the authoritarian threats the relentless political organizing on the religious right brings with it. At the same time, a lot of people who seem sold on the Christian nationalist agenda have probably not thought through how totally it would change the face of this country. House Speaker Mike Johnson delivering the keynote address for the National Association of Christian Lawmakers is just the latest piece of evidence that leaders who actively promote a Christian nationalist vision for America are now entrenched at the very highest levels of power in our country. An invaluable partner for Interfaith Alliance in the work of opposing these kinds of efforts is the Baptist Joint Committee. And I am very happy to have with me Holly Holman. General Counsel and Associate Executive Director of BJC, where she provides legal analysis of church-state issues that arise before Congress, the courts, and administrative agencies. Holly, welcome back to the State of Belief. So good to be with you, Paul. Thanks for having me. Well, we're going to talk about some really fun things like Christian nationalism and and the Speaker uh, Johnson. But before we do, I want to hear a little bit more about BJC. Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about the Baptist Joint Committee, the background, and what are you all doing today that we are so proud to support and collaborate with when we can? Yes, thank you so much. Paul, BJC comes out of that historic Baptist perspective that Baptists know, not all Baptists know, but if they scratch the surface of their history, they find out. And that is that one of the distinctions of Baptist among Christian denominations is a commitment to individual responsibility and um, uh, choice in matters of faith. So I say it as a, my simple Sunday school girl raised in the deep South way of talking about is that God created us as free people, free to choose to follow uh, God in matters of faith. And so Baptists believe that we should respect God's creation. Um, So there are theological and historical and experiential reasons that Baptists have been known for fighting for religious freedom, not just for themselves, but for all people. And BJC comes out of that historic Baptist understanding and uh, a coalition of Baptists because Baptists have are democratically uh, organized. They're they're a, a bottom up denomination instead of a top-down denomination. So you have lots of different kinds of Baptists that have organized voluntarily into associations and conventions 
And a group of those Baptists came together to make sure that there was a voice for the Baptist uh, commitment to religious freedom in the nation's capital more than 80 years ago. Actually, we're approaching a 90-year history of Baptists coming together to work for religious freedom for all. Of course, the work has taken different shapes and different had different focus depending on the era. Um, but a lot of that work has been in being true to our Baptist roots, speaking truth to power in the halls of Congress and the courts and agencies and at different levels of government, but also in communities, encouraging each other at our churches to be a strong witness for religious freedom for all. And today, one of our biggest efforts is to fight Christian nationalism, which has um, become this very clear and present threat to religious freedom for all, that religious freedom for all, that's not just a Baptist distinctive, but an American distinctive in our constitutional tradition. Um, and as BJC has always worked in this area of religious freedom, we have uh, recently focused more of our attention, not just in, in reminding people, of course, we're not a Christian nation legally, but to really, um, get to this idea that some people, when they talk about being a Christian nation, are actually advocating for us to be a Christian nation in a distinct and different way that is at odds, fundamentally at odds, with the kind of religious freedom that Baptists and other Christians and other dissenters fought for to ensure right. that Americans are free. Yeah. And it's so important that this is actually coming out of a religious impulse. I had some Baptist ancestry, as you know, but when I went to seminary and started hearing about like soul freedom, this idea of soul yeah. freedom, that each of us actually had it in us to make choices about our lives and that God was working within us to make those choices and that government should not be imposing those choices, including around religion. And so like the work that BJC is so good, you know, especially this work about Christians against Christian nationalism. You know, Interfaith Alliance is, is a multi-faith interfaith group, but it's just so important for those of us who are Christians to say, you know, you're, you're claiming this faith and you get to mandate everything on us about individual choices. And it's just, that's not the Baptist tradition. And I would say that's not the American tradition that I think BJC has so strongly stood up for. Now, now I, I detect a slight regional accent. Uh, am I right in that? Uh, tell me about your background. Like, where? how did you get to here? You're a lawyer. You work in religion. What was your trajectory to get here? Because all of us have a story about how we, how we got to feel so passionate about this work of religious freedom for all, not just for some. Yes. Um, it is true that I am a daughter of the South um, and people can't guess my accent because I've been all over the Southeast, but I was raised in Jackson, Mississippi and a Baptist church. I often, I often joke about saying um, I was raised in a Southern Baptist church or as we called it at the time, a Baptist church, because <laughs> I say that because uh, the, the Baptists have changed and it certainly was not something that was emphasized in my church growing up as sort of kind of code for any particular political leanings or restrictions on, on people in ministry or who could come to join a church or come together. So right. the Baptist tradition I come out of is one that you focus on the Bible, focus on following the witness of Jesus, a lot of Christian discipleship, a lot of you know community. Of course, Every story is is rich in experience, and and we're all shaped by lots of different influences. But I would say that I got a heavy dose of the Bible and the living witness of Christians and the responsibility to other people and the voluntariness of choosing to live a faithful life. And mm -hmm. so when I became a, a lawyer and learned about, well, I heard about BJC growing up, but not did not know about it that much. But when I, when I learned about it later, it made perfect sense that there was an agency dedicated to protecting religious freedom in law, because it fit very much with the understanding in the Baptist life that I grew up in, in that, you know, you had to individually decide to 
make a statement of faith. No one forced you and no one could. That voluntariness and that, that soul freedom was definitely part of the story that I had grown up with and fit very much with the advocacy perspective of BJC. One of the things I love about that story is that it's a Christian witness that shows like a real deep root in a tradition, in a faith tradition, that is inspiring your work. I think the easy narrative and the narrative that I think groups like the one that we're going to talk about today is they want us to think it's the secular Christian haters versus the true people of faith. That's the narrative that they really want to push, that they're the ones safeguarding the faith. And I think it's just really important that we want to name that they represent a small slice of Christian America that is diminishing and and yet they're trying to claim like so even the National Association of Christian Lawmakers they're claiming both the law and faith and saying we're the ones who are going to put it forward and what they mean by that is a very small narrow interpretation of what Christianity is and what the law is and let me say something about that Paul related to not just my background, but so many people in this country grow up in places where you look around and there are so many churches. Why are there so many churches if we all believe the same exact thing? If we all worship the same, if we all emphasize the same, if we all, um, you know, have the same practices? No, we are a very diverse country, even within the Christian tradition. And that is one thing that we wanted to hold up in the Christians Against Christian Nationalism project is, is to remind people to stop and think about who they are as Christians. And there's a lot of diversity there. And then who we are as Americans. And there is diversity there. But what brings us together and, and how together, um, you know, we are not, you, we don't, those aren't the same. We don't merge those um, identity. So yeah, you're right. The, any attempt by some group to say that they are the voice of Christians in America, uh, you know, should should raise a lot of red flags. Yeah, it does raise a lot of red flags. I want to just do a description. This was in the Rolling Stone article. This is of the logo that uh, National Association of Christian Lawyers has. I'm quoting more or less verbatim from the Rolling Stone article that's excellent if people want to learn more. The NACL logo is a crusader's shield, red emblazoned with a white cross. One of the leaders said that the red represents the blood of Jesus Christ um, shed on the cross as a sacrifice for the salvation of all humanity. And the emblem, he says, is meant to evoke the biblical shield of faith that promises to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And I know that you have noticed there is a lot of rhetoric around the evil one, around the work of Satan, by which they mean anyone who opposes them in a democracy. <laughs> They're kind of replacing biblical texts with the evil one or Satan with the left or something like that. This is a playbook to get people thinking, oh, this is what I have to buy in in order to be a good Christian. Now, one of the reasons we wanted to talk today was to raise awareness about this group, specifically because they're giving an award to the Speaker of the House, Johnson, and he gave a keynote there. And the award that they're giving to him is the American Patriot Award for Christian Honor and Courage. And again, just a reminder to our listeners, you're listening to two Baptists who are really worried about um, the Speaker of the House going into this organization, which, by the way, has said terrible things about LGBTQ people, terrible things about women who want reproductive freedom, terrible things about other faith traditions. And so what do you make of Mike Johnson, first of all, as a figure? on the American political landscape and religious landscape at the same time. Can you talk a little bit about Mike Johnson and how you're understanding his role in our body politic right now? Well, you know, BJC, like most people and most organizations are just learning about him, right? We didn't, no one was paying attention to him. And now we know a lot. We know about his longtime commitment to um, these Christian nationalist ideas. Um, unfortunately, he comes out of Baptist life and Southern Baptist life and, and some um, some conflicts that we know about that put power above any kind of commitment to Christian beliefs is, is my view of it. Is he out of the Southern Baptist Convention? That's right. 
affiliated with Southern Baptist institutions. Yeah. Yes. And so I think it's important for, you know, you and I kind of, this is, this is almost a secondhand language. Yeah. Um, but for those of you who are listening, who aren't aware, the Southern Baptist convention used to have women preachers signed an amicus brief on, on the Roe v. Wade, just around the freedom of conscience to be able to make your own decisions around reproductive decisions. And so it was another Baptist denomination and then it got taken over by a really, this is, you know, how to describe it, a strong patriarchy that started, you know, basically expelling women, just beginning to exercise a kind of control that this idea of soul freedom is anathema to. So I just wanted to make sure that people were aware that he comes out of that tradition, and so does Holly, and they come out in completely different ways. Yeah, the Southern Baptist Convention has taken positions, has they've strayed strayed from their roots for sure in many ways. And and we all have look, we all have complicated histories and we all have things that we have to answer for in our history and our work. Right. But sure. what's different when we say Southern Baptist is is that th- while they might share this history of religious freedom and still talk about that in recent decades, they have put certain issues above the Bible, above this idea of soul freedom and following the life of Jesus and that being how you interpret scripture. And instead, yes, even most recently has gone after any women pastors in ways that I never heard of growing up and reading the Bible. And well, you know, un- when, you know, when Rick Warren's church gets That's expelled, right. that's a little sign. And also yeah. like they've taken stands against awareness around racial history in their country um, that is just surprising. It's just That's important right. <laughs> context for uh, Speaker Johnson to be aware that this is what he comes out of. And I would be very interested in what kind of remarks he gives to this to this group, Paul, because from what I can see and what I've read, there is a, there has been a hiding from some of his past work. In podcasts and writings, there have been some some um, ideas that he that he no longer wants to be affiliated with. And yet, if he's going into these groups that are so associated with Christian nationalism, so that he's, I would like to hear what he's saying to them. Mm-hmm. And my biggest concern is, you know, as you described that group, to me, it sounded like they were trying to create create their own church. This little, this National Association of, of Christian Legislators, the way they describe themselves, you know, that they're defining themselves in a particular way. And it's 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 such a problem it's such a problem one and like i don't like the idea that a bunch of legislators is going to uh create a church and and define it and hold themselves out as representatives of christianity um it it really it's concerning about how they're representing the faith putting this kind of national christian legislators out there um and how it's how they're describing legislators as if legislators should be defined by their religion. So, you know, those those concepts and the fact that Speaker Johnson would be uh, affiliated with them. And I don't know what he's, what he said there. And, you know, we're, we're listening to see how much of his past he sticks with in his current role. Um, But, but it's, it's pretty significant. And I think he has responsibilities, um, you know, as a legislator and great power, as well as someone holding himself out um, as a Christian to um, to do much better than what we've what we've seen in the in the past. And let me be really clear. Look, the idea of talking about your faith in the public square, even as an elected official, is not something BJC would be critical of. I mean, we all we Let's see. I think it's uh, principle number one in Christians Against Christian Nationalism. Our our statement of principles is that we believe that all citizens have the right and responsibility to advocate for in in in, gov- in government the government. So you have the right and responsibility, regardless of faith. We're equal citizens. Um, the problem is when you're doing so in order to enact and privilege one particular faith in ways that are going to harm others and in ways that are at odds with that principle of equal citizenship and equal rights rights to bring your religion to the public square. A hundred percent. I, you know, I had the privilege of interviewing 
President Jimmy Carter about some of his books. And I think he said this very well. He was like, uh, Billy Graham was mad at me because I didn't invite him to do services in the White House. But the reason I didn't is I didn't want people to think that I was going to use the White House to promote my faith at the expense of other faiths and to leverage government to privilege my faith over any other faith in this country. And Jimmy Carter was, you know, certainly, uh, well, I, it's hard to judge people's hearts, but he was one of the most pious presidents we've ha- had in the 20th century. And and I think that that was a perfect example of what you're saying. It's like he was extremely religious and out there about it, but he didn't want to use his position to leverage government to elevate his faith over others. And I think that that's just a really important distinction. And actually, Jamie Raskin, I had a chance to talk to him. He was like, absolutely, people have, well, you know, it's just when they begin to use government in order to promote their religious ideas on the rest of the citizenry is where it crosses the line. But there's not about restricting religion from public square. That's right. That's well, what Jimmy Carter was saying is so core to it sounds so Baptist. It, I mean, it just sounds so uh, faithful in that yeah. that Jesus called us and said, whosoever will follow me, follow me. And so it's just that belief that that you may be called into religious faith, a life of faith, but you're not forced into it. And so why would you force that on anyone else? It's a, It would be yeah. a total disrespect for how religion works as a live and ongoing force in people's life to think that you could legislate and tell someone exactly what it means and has to mean to them. All people, including Christians, should be wary of this group, not because there's anything wrong with being a Christian legislator, but we need to be looking at what they say, what they're representing, and making sure that they don't try to speak for all Christians or all legislators. Uh, You know, it it, it reminds me of something that uh, Reverend Wilton Gaddy once said to me, and it's always stuck with me, and that is, just because something says Christian on the outside doesn't mean it has Jesus on the inside. (laughs) <laughs> well, I love, you know, I, th- that sounds so Baptist preacher to me. And so I, I love, I love hearing you say that. And I, I, especially from, from your, your seat at the BJC, I really appreciate that. You know, one of the things that we are very much watching, which is part of what NACL does is they have created these laws. They helped develop the law in Texas, which kind of created bounties for women who were having abortions. And what is happening across the country that we're seeing is that other states are seeing these kinds of laws and they're very much in conversation with them and that they get exported across the country and replicated. And so lawmakers are getting these laws that are not coming out of the grassroots of their own state, but rather are coming from outside and being imposed on states. And this is a kind of a model of a kind of way of governing that seems very much outsider down rather than the people of the location and that context up. Do you have any ideas about that and how that is, you know, how that functions in an American democracy? Well, um, we can spread good ideas or we can spread bad ideas. And this is the effort to put model legislation out there. Lots of groups do that. But it's great to be aware of this. It's great, Paul, that you're raising that for people to be aware. And it's it's basically a call to action to to know what's going on in your community, know what the laws right. are, and know who who's asking for change and why. And you know that's the real question: is that those who are intent on changing the law have the responsibility to explain why and to and to advocate and to move things. And so and they have to fight back against any of these top down efforts that the people don't want and to ask questions. And, and, you know, we'll see where this goes. Obviously, we're having a huge debate nationally and in states and localities on reproductive rights. And a, a lot of we're learning a lot about what people truly believe and the importance of women's health and how it's not so easily boiled down to you know, uh, pro-life or pro-choice. But in fact, you know, there's a lot that people need to understand and learn about taking care of human beings Mm. and uh, what's it, what's at stake there. So they have these efforts, but I think we're going to see a lot of, uh, a lot of pushback. I think we are, we are seeing that. 
Yeah, well, and I th- I want to just again like highlight Christians against Christian nationalism. I think you have a website, right, where people yes. can go if they is it just Christians against Christian nationalism dot org? It is. It is okay. Yeah. Oh, that is great. Yeah, and it- I do th- I do think that this is like. This is a, a movement that anyone can get involved in. I think there is, uh, you know, BJC is a great organization to work with. And people, you know, they, they will, if you send them inquiries and if you want to begin to imagine something like this in your uh, hometown, home state, um, I really encourage you to go on their website, learn more, learn about, you know, learn about what's happening, not only in your neighborhood, but nationally, and then figure out how you can plug in. That's right. Yes, it is an opportunity. It is it is grown as a national network with signers throughout the country in every congressional district and rural areas um, and urban areas. Um, I think, you know, it really hit a hit a nerve that that uh, so many Christians are unhappy with the the impact they see of Christian nationalism and the public face that they see of Christianity coming out of some of these circles. And very sadly, when it comes out of (laughs) elected officials and a a way to organize and and fight back and and understand and support uh, uh, understanding of our country that allows, you know, allows more full and honest and, uh, you know, debate consistent with our American principles. I love that. I would love to hear your latest reflections on the Supreme Court uh, and uh, any thoughts you have about the way you see the Supreme Court um, functioning right now. And um, yeah, any any reflections? I you know I I grew up revering the court uh, because of uh, um, my great grandfather was on the court and um, uh, and I, I mentioned like. I said to Jamie Raskin in an interview, I, was, I said, well, I don't think the court is going to save us. And he said, the court has never saved us. <laughs> and so, and so yes. I, I, I'm curious what you think about, yeah. about you know, the Supreme Court right now and, and how it's functioning in this conversation about religion in America. I agree that the, the court has never saved us, but the court has done a, a better job at, at different times um, of helping us live into the promise of the the First Amendment. I mean, we're at a time of great change in the in many areas of the law. So religious freedom is just one area of the law that's undergone a lot of change with this court, which is a court that tends to be very ideological. And it's been really difficult in the work we do to explain how um, the First Amendment protects religious freedom with some of the decisions the court has made in, in, in recent years. At the same time, I will not give up on the court. I do believe that they are aware of the kind of criticism that they are undergoing, the kind of lack of um, confidence that the American public has in the court. And I am I am going to continue to um, hope that that this court um, can at least continue to uphold religious freedom, this promise of free exercise and no establishment in a way that can hold our, our country together. But I totally agree with Congressman Raskin that we don't rely on the court. Um, religious liberty is what we as Americans are willing to do for ourselves and each other to uphold religious freedom for all, regardless of whether um, you know the court Whatever the court says is constitutional, uh, they get the last say there, but we get to say what is right and Mm. we get to uh, pass laws and treat each other in ways that are right. And that is that is in respecting uh, religious freedom for all and becoming a more just society. I really appreciate that. I, you know, I, I had a really strong visceral reaction to Creative 303, as you might imagine. And um, and one of the things I just, you know, st- it just I was like, just because people can do it doesn't mean they should do it. And yeah. and, and, and and so it's just really and let's important don't expect to remember them to. that. And let's, right. yeah. let's don't <laughs> so expect just, them I, to. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, right. So I think that that is such a helpful, um, helpful way to look at the court right now. It, you know, it's a, uh, it's hopeful, but also puts the onus a little bit on us, um, and not so much on um, only on the law, uh, which is I think super important. Just last question that I like to ask is um, for all of us is you know we talk about a lot of the challenges that are happening right now, but but 
what gives you hope right now? What are the what are the signs of hope that you see or where you turn for hope in your work? You know, I continue to find um, hope actually in conversations with um, Christians and people of other faiths and no faith at all. So I'm I'm fortunate that I get to talk to people about their life experiences and their religious backgrounds. And so often, you know, people um, move forward in life taking some of what they learn and letting go of some things that they learned didn't serve them later. Um, but but the idea that that people um, want to live full lives, serving others, um, being thankful for for the opportunities that we have in this country to choose religion or not. When, I think that really gives me hope um, often when I'm getting to do work for BJC or talking about Christians against Christian nationalism, um, the affirmation we get um, from people who are so thankful um, and, you know, often too, Paul, I'll hear, I'll, I'll meet someone from another, from another country who says how lucky we are as Americans and how they have been able to express their faith, and it doesn't have to be, it can be be other other faiths be outside of Christianity in ways that they were not able to in other countries, and just mm-hmm. remind. So I, I think I, I take hope in um, those that are willing to look at and remind ourselves what we get right as well as what we have failed to do, and mm-hmm. what we have to do better. In. Thank you. Holly Holman is general counsel and associate executive director of the Baptist Joint Committee, where she provides legal analysis of church state issues that arise before Congress, the courts and administrative agencies. Holly, I really appreciate you taking time for the state of belief today. It's great to be with you. Thanks so much, Paul. Up next, more on the strategies to hold back Christian nationalism in the name of faith. I'll be joined by Interfaith Alliance Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy, Darcy Hirsch. If you miss any part of today's program, you can hear full episodes of The State of Belief anytime on our website at stateofbelief.com. And make sure you subscribe to the Next Generation Podcast at stateofbelief.com slash new podcast. That's stateofbelief.com slash new podcast. You're listening to The State of Belief, where religion and democracy meet. I'm Roxy Stone. And I'm Caitlin Beatty. Stay by the City is a podcast from two Christian women cracking the code of faith from the mean streets of New York City. Our podcast captures what happens when purity culture meets hookup culture, when distraction steals from devotion, and when the diversity of viewpoints and lifestyles clash against assumptions. Gotham can be a weird place for Christian women, but we're out there and we have stories to tell. Stay by the City, wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. listening. Darcy Hirsch is Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy at Interfaith Alliance. She is both a lawyer, but also went to Divinity School at Harvard Divinity School. And she is really at the forefront of Interfaith Alliance's work at this moment that is really impacted by what's going on on Capitol Hill with Speaker Johnson and all of those who are driven by a Christian nationalist agenda. So, One of the things I wanted to ask Darcy about is also about this group, the National Association of Christian Lawmakers. This is a new group, a fairly new group, right? Or has it been around for a little bit? Well, they were founded in 2019 by a former uh, state legislator from Arkansas um, as a national membership organization for Christian lawmakers uh, who have essentially pledged to implement a biblical wor- worldview into their policymaking. And again, as as we talked to Holly about this, all of those words like what biblical worldview means and, you know, using Christian biblical worldview as if they own it somehow. What they mean actually is anti-LGBTQ policies. What they mean is anti-women's uh, ability to make decisions about our reproductive freedom. What they mean is like establishing Christian hegemony and, and being able to restrict books that people can read. <laughs> so this is a four-year-old group. 
but already they're having Speaker Johnson show up and be their keynote. That feels like a leap for a group that's only four years old. I mean, I think the fact is that they have relationships, right? Speaker Johnson was a lawyer for Alliance Defending Freedom, which is the organization that has put forward so much um, anti-LGBTQ, anti-reproductive freedom, pro uh, prayer in school uh, model legislation around the country. And so while the National Association of Christian Lawmakers is fairly new, it's building upon uh, many years of uh, organizations connected to Christian nationalism that have been working on these issues. Yeah, that's an interesting connection there. And I don't really know the formal connection between Alliance Defending Freedom and the National Association of Christian Lawmakers. But it's I'm sure I'm sure there's overlap there because it seems like they're both reading from the same playbook around a Christian nationalist agenda, which is essentially imposing as very specific worldview upon the rest of the population. That's right. This is all part of a national coordinated effort to undo the separation of church and state. Right. And put in a very particular um, strand of one faith tradition that does not represent anywhere near the majority opinion. And it doesn't give the ability for people to make choices about their own life. It's very involved in like kind of how people live their personal lives and trying to make decisions for individuals. That's the reason it feels so threatening to many of us who are imagining what a world would look like if these people actually were successful. Isn't it the establishment of a theocracy? Does it, Am I overstating something? No, I mean, that's absolutely right. And it's using religion as a sword to discriminate against anybody that thinks or believes differently than they do. Right. I was just thinking about this today, like they should own their bigotry. Like they should just own it. Don't hide behind Christianity. Don't hide behind the law. These are things that don't necessarily lead to the decisions that you're making. Own your bigotry. Own what you're trying to do. You know, you want to discriminate against LGBTQ people. Own it. You want to take women's rights uh, to have reproductive freedom. Own it. Don't use Christianity and don't use the the idea of the the founding of this country as supporting what you're trying to do. That neither of those things are are true. Own your agenda. Instead, they kind of hide behind this idea of that we're, they're representing religion or something like that. I'm sorry. I know I'm ranting, Darcy. You have to put up with this. Poor Darcy, like brings the brings the intelligence, and I'm I'm out here ranting. But talk to me a little bit about you as someone who has really studied religion, studied interfaith relations, studied like the intersection between law and religion, how you imagine um, interfaith alliance uh, responding in this moment? Like, what do you think are important ways, at least that we build awareness about what's happening and then in, an invitation to the American public to respond? Sure. And thank, thank you, Paul. And I mean, the fact is they're hiding behind religion, but they're also using religion because it's compelling. They can spread their message. They can get buy-in. Um, and that's how that's that's how they gain legitimacy and that's how they gain support. And that's why it's so important for Interfaith Alliance and our partners to be showing up and saying that this is what true religious freedom looks like. This is what our interpretation of the Bible looks like, right? Um So the way that Interfaith Alliance is really uh, leading on this issue was both through our work on Capitol Hill, working with national policymakers to show up and say that our view of religious freedom does not include a religion that discriminates against others. Um, And also, similarly, on the state level, we are working with our affiliates across the country to track and respond to legislation and specifically the kind of state legislation that is being introduced by members of the National Association of Christian Lawmakers. So bills to ban um, anti-gender affirming care, bathroom bill bans, bills to implement school prayer, the Ten Commandments bill that recently uh, failed in, in Texas last year or the um, the bill that in Louisiana last year that passed that requires in God we trust to be posted in classrooms. And so we're tracking this legislation. We're giving resources to our affiliates to speak out and fight back. 
as we look forward to the 2024 election, um, you know, I know all eyes are on the, the presidential race and, and the congressional races, but there's also state level races around the country. And it's critical that people pay attention to all of these races and understand what it means um, when a candidate is talking about LGBTQ discrimination, when a candidate is talking about their personal faith and their goals of legislating based on that faith to discriminate against others um, and take away women's reproductive freedoms. These are all connected. And so Interfaith Alliance is working to educate voters over the next several months about how all of these policy issues are connected to Christian nationalism and how people of faith can speak up and fight back and and vote to ensure that the candidates that they're endorsing are embracing true religious freedom and inclusive democracy. And, and I think this is so important because what, you know, again, this is this is not about, you know, kind of godless secularism, um, not that there's anything wrong with that. But, you know, like, you know, people don't have to have a faith, but it is the, the dichotomy they're trying to make is these like godless liberals versus these like pious and Christian people who are just trying to bring Christian values. And that's not actually what's happening. It's a very particular set of values that they're trying to impose on others. And and what we want people to be aware of is that that has repercussions. When these people gain office, and we're seeing this like one of our affiliates in Southwest Florida, Christian nationalists gain control of the school board and are able to implement policies that feel very disadvantaged to Jewish students, to students who don't have any religious... like. Also, I just want to, when you put in, in God we trust into the schools and just say, oh, this will be helpful. No, it's not helpful. Who's interpreting that for you? Who's going to say, what What do we mean by that? If you are believe in parents' rights, you should be very fearful of any random person explaining God in a public school to your kids. I just think it makes no sense to me. But what does make sense is the great work that you and your team are doing on the state level and at the federal level to really explain this to legislatures. And I've I've been in the room with you where we go in and talk to representatives and we just explain like what true religious freedom can mean and help them understand why in order to represent the, the, the diversity of people in their district, it's really important that they understand this and not buy into this Christian nationalist rhetoric. That's absolutely right. How are you seeing the impact of Speaker Johnson's kind of assuming that role and what it means to have someone who is so enmeshed in the Christian nationalist agenda at such a high level of power in the country? So I think, you know, it's really interesting um, you know, he was elected to be speaker after, you know, several several failed attempts for, from other candidates, and he was relatively unknown. Um, what's the most concerning about the fact that he he was voted in overwhelmingly was that that his Christian nationalist kind of history um, and that he's actually legislated on in the past um, was a really just brushed over by by many of the Republicans and and Democrats that that voted for him. It's fair to say that we were at a point where the government um, needed to function, right, that that the House had been without a speaker for so long, um, that they really did need somebody to lead and, 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 and get back to a sense of normalcy. But to elect a speaker with a history like that really just shows the normalization of Christian nationalism and the acceptance um, and really, I think many members of Congress turning a blind eye uh, to, to some real problematic policy history uh, that, that the speaker has engaged in. Now, to be fair, he has not yet um, legislated um, based on those values. He certainly said things when his swearing in, when he was sworn in, he said he was called by God to fulfill this post, as all members of Congress have been. I mean, there's a lot of assumptions he's making based on his history and personal faith. You know, obviously, his his accepting being honored uh, by this association this week is extraordinarily concerning. Um, but we're working very closely with the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, which is led by Representatives Jamie Raskin and um, Representative Jared Huffman, um, who are are really uh, keeping an eye on on the, the speaker's Christian nationalist worldview and ensuring that. Um, 
that 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 he's monitored and that and that people are educated about about what that means and what we can do to to, to stop it. I think that's really important. And the the Free Thought Caucus is so interesting because it's you know it, it is about free thought and it's also about the diversity of thought that is represented in Congress. So it is made up of people of all different faith traditions as well as uh, you know secular humanists and, and others. And so, you know, in some ways it's re- going to be really interesting to see what the Free Thought Caucus um, does and, a, and an offering a different way forward that is really representative of the American people. And hopefully, hopefully we will, I look forward to hearing much more about that. Tell me about like, one of the tactics, and this has been very interesting, is that they take these bills and they put them around the country. And so all of a sudden, our affiliate in North Dakota is dealing with a bill that is not grown there, but it's been imported there. Like, what are what are some suggestions that you have for people who kind of all of a sudden see see these bills being imported um, from other states that uh, are being you know put forth as legislative um, potential laws in their in their state, but that don't actually represent the people? What what are some of the things that people in local communities might do in order just to raise awareness? They, I mean, the first is to just keep an eye on what's happening. I mean, the, the Texas chaplain bill that we opposed last year that we've been working on um, in Texas has now been introduced in Ohio. So this is um, not surprising, but these organizations shop these model bills all around the country. So first is to just, if you see something happening in one state, it could potentially come come to yours. Um, it's important to build relationships with your legislatures to to ensure that they understand what the needs of the local community are. Um, you know, invite them to your church, invite them to your mosque, invite them to your synagogue so that they know you. They know what the needs of the community are. They love to go <laughs> to, to houses of worship, to your community center. Um, build that relationship, and 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 that's really um, the first the first step. Yeah. And explain it, it's a way of showing the diversity of opinion that may be in their community that they may not have been aware of because they hadn't been invited before. So I think that's really important. So one of the things I just wanted to kind of also touch on is right now we are seeing, um, you know, this, you know, the the evidence and the representation of Christian nationalism in our government at a time when, you know, the anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and the kind of strong rhetoric and then indeed violence that is happening in this country. Um, and so I just, I, I was wondering how you imagine like being able to talk about all of these things at once. It feels very overwhelming, but it also doesn't seem completely unrelated. It's all related. Um, you know, there we are in a very polarized time and people are, are very reactionary. And we really need to remember our common bonds so that we can fight back against our common enemy, which as as, as we've discussed is, is coming from this Christian nationalist playbook. So it's just so important, um, you know, during this time for people of faith to come together and find common ground um, so that we can mobilize and speak out with a unified voice. Yeah. One thing I've talked about on this show before, and I want to urge people to go to our website and uh, Interfaith Alliance slash uh, Stronger Together, which is uh, we have a pledge that is really about showing up for one another, recognizing that we're in a spike of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia specifically, that we this was before the conflict in the Middle East that had not been seen since 2001. And now it's grown to just exponentially. It's really terrible. And the the goal here is for us to show up for one another and say we we will not let this happen um, on our watch and really commit to it and commit to people who you know are our own people, but also perhaps even as important is to commit to show up for people who aren't what we might describe as our people. But by showing up, we show that we actually are you know, have common humanity, common bond, common future if we can build it together. And I just think that it's really important in this moment where we, we're just seeing all the things that are attempting to divide us to 
to try to figure out like how how we can imagine a future together. And I know that this is something that you and um, and the entire Interfaith Alliance team is working on so much. And I just I appreciate it so much. Is there anything right now that gives you hope? Uh, for um, in this moment, as we've talked about, quite a somber, you know, but there is, you know, I think there's always hope. Where do you find it? There's hope. And and thank you for asking that. You know, you mentioned our pledge. We have hundreds of people who've already signed on and now we're taking organizational signatures. And I know that many of our local affiliates have used the pledge to to put together community events, to start dialogue. I mean, the fact that, that people are are reaching out to one another. This may be a difficult time, but we know that these relationships will heal eventually and and that we can come together in mutual support um, really really gives me hope. I really appreciate that. And again, thank you for all your work. Darcy Hirsch is the incredibly effective Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy at Interfaith Alliance. Darcy, I know I Gave you zero advance notice about being on the show today. So a special thanks for bringing your passion and expertise to the state of belief and for all your work you do. Thank you, Paul. And that's all the time we have for the state of belief this week. Please be sure to subscribe to the new and improved podcast called The State of Belief at Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform or at stateofbelief.com slash new podcast. Subscribe to The State of Belief today. We need your help keeping The State of Belief going. I hope you'll consider being a partner in this crucial work by making a financial contribution today. Information on how to donate is available at stateofbelief.com. That's stateofbelief.com. And if you're getting something out of the show, share it with your friends and family. Let's get more people listening and keep these conversations going when the show is over. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at State of Belief and share State of Belief with the people in your networks. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of Religion News Service or Religion News Foundation. State of Belief is produced by Ray Kirstein and is a production of Interfaith Alliance. Become a member today at interfaithalliance.org. And be sure to join us next week. I can't wait. Until then, I'm Paul Brandeis Rauschenbusch on the State of Belief, where religion and democracy meet.